Thank you for the invitation. I'm very grateful to join you in conversations on science and photography. And um, I'm now going to share my screen with you. Okay. The term scientific photography often calls to mind a dazzling impression of iconic photographs, stars, x-rays, bacteria, the moon. But photography and science are as likely to also include many other types and genres of photographs, many of them less beautiful and more mundane, encompassing portraits of scientific classrooms, scientific educational photos, photographs of scientific museum specimens, police records, even photographs and other images that circulate as part of counter science movements, challenging scientific heterodoxies. A photograph taken on a visit to Prague to see the museum dedicated to the life and work of Czech animation film director Karol Zeman, for example, shows how he used engraved illustrations, live action, cutouts, paintings, scientific photos, and other animation techniques to make such films as Journey to Prehistory, Jules Verne's Journey to the Center of the Earth, and his anti-war fantasy on the comet, among many others. At top right is a photograph showing my daughter at the museum trying out one of the special visual effects flying machines. What I want to share today is some research that I'm doing for a new project that considers the historical forces through which photography became both a product and a record of chemical industrialization and its legacies. Over the past few summers, I've been doing research in a region of Northwest Britain that's located in the area shown here between Liverpool and Manchester. This region was the site of the world's first generation of chemical factory towns manufacturing alkali for soap, textiles, and glass products. As one of the most polluted parts of the country, this region was also among the first to see laws regulating the production of chemical waste into rivers and farmlands. The development and spread of photography as an industrial art form in the 19th century occurred at almost exactly the same time as the creation of Britain's chemical corridor. Photography as it emerged in the 19th century was both a product and a record of Britain's chemical industries and their legacies. Photographs were used to document the effects of chemical pollution in the 19th century. Legal cases against industry for pollution were prosecuted in the 19th century, mainly under nuisance laws. In 1863, the British Parliament passed the first of several alkali acts, the first modern air pollution legislation. The act allowed that no more than 5% of the hydrochloric acid produced by alkali plants could be vented to the atmosphere. To comply with the legislation, Soda Works passed the escaping hydrogen chloride gas up through a tower packed with charcoal, where it was absorbed by water flowing in the other direction. The chemical works usually dumped the resulting hydrochloric acid solution into nearby bodies of water, killing fish and other aquatic life. The LeBlanc process also meant very unpleasant working additions for the operators. It required careful operation and frequent interventions, some involving heavy, heavy manual labor, resulting in injuries and deaths. By the 1880s, 0.75 million tons of waste were generated every year, containing about 100,000 tons of sulfur. Methods for converting the hydrochloric acid to chlorine gas for the manufacture of bleaching powder and for reclaiming the sulfur in the calcium sulfide waste had been discovered, but were not always used. This slide shows an example of the type of written testimony that was customary in 19th century legal proceedings. These are the kinds of vastly under-researched written records of photography's actual uses in society that are, I believe, important and even essential for recovering photography's epistemic meanings, values, and conditions. And even though I'm not gonna speak directly to this right now, just to kind of, just wanted to highlight it as a source. What we are looking at next is a series of photographs that were introduced into evidence in British nuisance cases starting as early as the 1850s and running into the 1890s. 
The Regina versus Spence case in 1857 is a great example of how a 19th century photographic album was used in a legal dispute. Certainly one of the, if not the earliest example of the use of photography in the prosecution of a nuisance case. The Manchester-based photographer James Mudd was among the first British photographers to document industrial subjects for a living. Mudd's photographs show trees stripped of their luxuriant foliage, a result of hydrochloric acid pollution from nearby chemical factories. The next photographs I'm showing are from a slightly later court case. The next two photographs are from an album kept by the Scottish environmental scientist, Dr. Robert Angus Smith, who was a factory inspector and who coined the term acid rain in 1852. And in these, I'm just drawing attention to, I just want to draw attention to the, the lack of foliage on the trees. This photograph we know was taken in the summer. And the last photograph I'll show is from a series of photographs of farmland taken a few years later in the same region, submitted by a local farmer as part of a complaint against a factory for damage to his crops from gas from nearby chemical works. This was taken in 1893 by a professional photographer. It's often been said that the camera doesn't lie, but it also can be hard to make it tell the truth. The photographs that I'm researching are scenes of industry built on and among living communities with their own histories, with their mixture of humans, industry, animals, and natural environments. Using nearly 300 visual representations, including drawings, engravings, photographs, and graphs that I've identified so far, I am analyzing the scientific impact of new forms of visual representation in chemical climatology. The project considers the role of photographs, both as historical records and as legal exhibits in Victorian court cases against the chemical industries, especially the use of specific visual exhibits used in debates over air and river pollution. Okay, the last part of my talk explores another dimension of the science industry nexus that is scientific experiments that led to practical innovations in mass photographic culture. Take for example, the S curve invented by two practical scientists who made a hobby of photography. The S curve describes a graphic relationship between the optic density or blackness of a film and the exposure. Behind the S curve is the story of a Victorian friendship between two amateur photographers both with scientific and family ties. Herter and Driffield, shown here, determined how the density of silver produced varied with the amount of light received and the method and time of development. The pair are credited with several innovations of photography, including bringing quantitative scientific practice through the methods of sensitometry and densitometry. Sensitometry, as many here know, is the scientific study of light sensitive materials, especially photographic film. Herder and Driffield invented a photographic exposure estimation device known as an actinograph, shown here in the figure. Together, they determined that the density of silver produced varied with the amount of light received and the method and time of development. Plots of film density versus the log of exposure are called characteristic curves or Herder Driffield curves. And this technique is still relevant to aspects of electronic imaging today. The development of the actinograph by the managers of chemical works contains a rich irony, of course, since getting the right exposure to show clouds or clouds of smoke in a bright sky was one of the greatest challenges of early photography. The photographer Gustave Legray's need to make a composite seascape owing to the radically different exposures needed for sky and sea is still a challenge for iPhone algorithms, for example. In a paper that they published in May 1890, Herder and Driffield distinguished between four different periods of exposure, including what Herder called a, a period of reversal, which he defined as a peculiar phenomenon in which the negative was transformed into a positive. This photographic portrait of Herder, made by the historian Ronald Callender, a specialist on the pair's work, illustrates this prediction. Herder was, of course, correct. The critical reception of their work led to commercial developments in photometers and eventually to further work on the nature of the latent image and the developed image. 
On the left is a hand a handbill produced to promote the sales of the actinograph exposure calculator, which Driffield sold from his home. And this photograph shows in an actinograph, a revolving drum with a printed graph of the light levels for different times of the day against the time of the year. The result was the exposure time. And I don't have one on my desk, but I'll bring one to show um, when, we, when we talk in a few minutes. It's quite a tiny object. The story of the actinograph is bound up with a larger history of immigration in the Industrial Revolution. Ferdinand Herder was Swiss. He became chief chemist and technical advisor of the new United Alkali Company until his death in 1898. Vero C. Driffield learned photography as a youth when he helped out in a photographer's studio and later became a leading engineer in the chemical trade. Driffield's daughter, Marion Ethel Driffield, usually called May, is often seen in her father's photographic experiments. Because her mother died in childbirth, it fell to her father and an aunt to raise her. May Driffield appears in many of her father's photographs, and I'm, I'm grateful to Ron Callender for drawing my attention to them and for their use. Some of the best photographs feature May and her father's syntetometric experiments. In this example, Driffield determines by calculation the necessary printing exposure using an Ilford slow paper. And we see that May's profile in the mirror has been carefully arranged so as to fall on the black card. In the next photograph, we see that May's white dress has been modified by black cloth and she poses with a step wedge, which features densities of known exposure. The, the experiment allowed her father to plot the densities of the negative after processing and from the ensuing curve so he could determine qualities such as gradation and sensitivity. And it's, a, it's an artifact of, of photographic collaboration also in the home and in the family environment. Driftfield probably made this autochrome plate in 1908. And as we see, May is, is an older um, woman at this point. And he, he, um, this one received an exposure of 22.5 seconds. And um, so these, these photographs also provide a, a kind of family record and portrait of May Driffield, as well as serving as photographic experiments. There's more to say about these photographs. Um, most of the photographs that I've described were located in the small town of Widnes in the region that I showed you on the map. This is a photograph of Widnes today. Um, it's taken from the Chemical Industry Museum, the Catalyst Museum, which was formerly the Hutchison Alkali Works. Um, some of you may be wondering why else Witness is famous. Um, and, and the answer is that the musician Paul Simon supposedly composed the lyrics to the folk song Homeward Bound at the Witness train station in 1965. And there's a plaque there um, to prove this. And there is a photograph of the Witness train station, a place I've, I've come to know very well. 100, 150 years ago, Witness was the crucible of the chemical industry in Britain and the world. A whole new society had formed by the 1870s to meet the needs of the new and rapidly growing chemical industry centered on the production of alkali products, um, which of course included photographic products. The project I'm working on aims to excavate the complex connections between photography, industrial work, land, gender, science, and the rise of the Victorian chemical town. This research suggests how complex photography was because of its connection with the chemical industry. Industrial chemistry was one of Britain's dirtiest and most toxic and most dangerous industries for those who made chemicals as well as for those who used them, including many photographers. As the quote on the slide suggests, however, chemistry also was seen at the time as providing beauty and civilization in a similar way, photographic chemistry, while being dirty and toxic, also captured sunlight and made commodities that entertained, provided solace, and produced new forms of knowledge. In conclusion, my current research seeks to show that photography emerged in the late 19th century as both a new mode of documenting the chemical revolution and as a technological process that was itself the product of chemical processes and processing. 
tracing the diverse routes through which photography entered and transformed Victorian industry offers new evidence of the dynamic historical uses of photographs, challenging simple reductionisms and anachronistic appeals to photographic essences. It also suggests the need for new interdisciplinary and empirical approaches to reckoning with our scientific futures, presence, and past. Thank you.